Hello, and welcome to Scandinavia House and tonight's book talk with Margaret Wilson uh, on her book, Woman, Captain, Rebel, The Extraordinary True Story of a Daring Icelandic Sea Captain, from source, out now from Source Books. This is a daring, magnificent, historical, nonfiction account of Iceland's most famous female sea captain who boldly defended men and women alike from injustices. I would also like to point out our current exhibition at Scandinavia House, which is on the third floor galleries on the Arctic Edge. Art artists explore the far north, presenting three contemporary photo-based artists who traverse the region of the Arctic Circle to probe themes ranging from time and memory, to landscape, to built environments, to science and mythology, and to the cha changing climates and features that which features artists Marion Bellinger, Claire Benson, and Steve Giovinco. So um, the gallery is open after the talk too, so please step outside if you haven't uh, seen that. Um, Scandinavia also hosts programs throughout the year, both in-house and virtually. Uh, these include concerts, film screenings, lectures, uh, literary events, and children's programming. So please do visit scandinavia.org for everything that we have on to offer. Uh, and this video, uh, this today's talk is being recorded and will be made available also on our website and our YouTube page. So if you have friends who uh, you found this very interesting, you have friends who are interested in the topic, please do direct them to our website. Um, anthropologist and writer Margaret Wilson has traveled extensively in Brazil, Papua New Guinea, Mongolia, Australia, Europe, and Iceland. Her eclectic non-academic jobs have included abalone diving and being a deckhand on fishing boats off the south coast of Tasmania. She received her PhD in anthropology from the London School of Economics as a current, and currently is an affiliate associate professor at, with the Department of Anthropology and Scandinavian Studies at the University of Washington. She is also a senior associate scientist at the Stephenson Arctic Institute in Iceland. Her previous books include Sea Woman of Iceland, Survival on the Edge, uh, Dance Lest We All Fall Down, Breaking Cycles of Poverty in Brazil, and beyond. She lives in Seattle uh, and with her partner and their cat, Mr. Uh, <laughs> the book is on sale, uh, but we you need to purchase the book down in the shop, uh, and then afterwards, Margaret is more than happy to sign it. So please do purchase the book. Uh, this, they do help support uh, these literary events as Canada to But now is my great pleasure to welcome Margaret to the stage. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> um, yeah, I appreciate you guys coming. Yeah, this is, uh, I, this is, I haven't been to New York for years, so it's, it's fun to be here. And I've never been to Scandinavian House, so, so it's great to be here. Um, and then we think about the chance of anything we do. Uh, for you coming here or anything, any place we might go. And I'm going to say that this whole writing of this book and me getting involved with Iceland was uh, completely by chance. Uh, if we believe in chance, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I do. But um, when about in the early 2000s, I bought a house in Seattle, which even then I could hardly afford. And I rented out rooms. And I rented one of them to a woman from Iceland. And she and I became very close friends. We still are today. And she was going to take a trip to her native Iceland in the early 2000s. And she said, I was working in Brazil at the time. And she said, you know, would you like to come and visit me there? It wasn't the tourist spot it is today. And I thought, well, when am I ever going to go to Iceland? It's never going to happen. So sure. So I went there. And while we were there, she, being the proper host she was, is, she took me around to see the sites. So we went to uh, just about an hour east, southeast of Reykjavik, and to the coast. Uh, this is sort of the beach just north of this community, what it looks like now, then. And then we went to the small community of Stokseri, which is about 400 people. And this is uh, what it looked like then. And Except for the modern houses, this is where the action of this book takes place mostly, and it looked basically like this then. 
although the seawall, they've had to increase it because of global warming. So, so we walked down a sort of a, a street of houses, and we came across this rustic hut. It looked worse then than it does here, actually. It's been, and my friend Disa, she leaned over the Icelandic inscription next to it, and it said, this is the, it was dated 1949, and it said, this is the reconstructed winter fishing hut of Thurida Inistotr. She lived from 1777 to 1863. And as <laughs> you now know, I've worked on boats myself. I've been around boats a lot. And I've worked in fishing. And I thought, she? Because I'm usually the only woman there. And also, you know, history would have us believe that there are no female fishing captains in history at all, zero, none. And that um, conversation changed my life, basically. It took me quite a few years, because I was director of a nonprofit in Brazil at the time. And so, but eventually, I changed my whole field site to Iceland because of this one occurrence. And it was a quest to find out about Thurida. And it first took me to learning all about a lot of sea women there and the whole history, which I find I really needed to know to write this book now. I just want to say this is a painting. This is from the late 1800s, Bjartni Jonsson. And it's that the huts, as you can see, these, these fish, fishing huts, they've improved. They've got like a loft above them. But this is basically what it was like when they went out in the winter, and they fished in the winter. And they went in open rowboats. That's what they did. Um, actually, I think this is also, this is a photograph from the late 1800s. But this is what the boats looked like um, in the 18, seven, late 1700s for a long time. They were long rowboats, up to 12 people, as few as four. So. Before I, this book, I was able, it's completely nonfiction, it's all cited, but I was able to write it so that it reads almost like a novel. And that's, you know, I wrote it, but it's because of this incredible written record that Iceland has. And um, I just have to say something about the history of Iceland to explain, I mean, this particularly this audience is going to know, I think. You know, Iceland is the place of the Vikings. And they wrote the incredible Icelandic sagas, some of the most remarkable literature known to humankind, I think, or well, many, but it is pretty amazing. And it's inspired everybody from Wagner to Tolkien to Game of Thrones to whoever. And then in the 12, 1300s, Iceland, through political infighting, they lost their independence. And then for 600 long years were ruled by Denmark. They didn't gain their independence until 1944. And during that time, they lived in incredible poverty. Um, their houses weren't much better than those huts, actually. They often they had no heat, because there wasn't any wood much, except uh, driftwood. Um, starvation was always a concern. But when I've talked to older Icelanders who understand the poverty of what this is, one thing they say that is so interesting is they say, we may not have had enough to eat, but almost everybody had at least one book. And for, at one time, Icelanders went down to 25,000 people due to volcanic eruptions and, and starvation and, and different plagues. But through all that, they kept their language alive and their sense of self through this almost obsession with literature and reading and writing. So everybody knew how to read, at least well enough to pass their catechism. And um, 
women weren't really taught to write. It was considered women didn't need to know how to write, but men did. And being a skull, being a, a poet, was really the highest honor you could have. It may be equal to being a fishing captain, actually. And people still do in Iceland, as those of you who've been in Iceland a lot know, poetry is really important. And they played all these games. Um, and people who could just do extemporaneous sort of clever words were remembered, and people talked about it. They had incredibly good memories. But what you happened is you had just regular farmers, just common people. They had no schools except one for priests, but people learned by traveling priests and by traveling teachers. So people, and they were very rural. So people on these farms, the men, learned to write, and they all obsessively wrote. And they wrote about their neighbors. But you can see the huge, and when you're reading these old documents, you can see the huge influence of the sagas. Because they don't just write, I don't know, something. They're, they're really interesting the way they write, right? They write about love trysts. They write about people who had babies when they weren't supposed to be having babies. They write about betrayals. They write about just the everyday activities. They write about exactly what it was like to go out fishing, for example, and where they caught the fish, and what happened, and who caught the biggest fish, and who caught how many fish, and who was a really crappy fisherman. So all these things, they actually wrote it down. And so it was like, as an anthropology, it's like an ethnography. And so they're all writing these various things. And if they thought a woman was worth writing about, they did. And that's how I found out about all these sea women for my last book. But Thuritur was a really, she was very, uh, very interesting from a child. And people wrote about her a lot. So she started fishing when she was 11 on her father's boat. This was not that uncommon. But she was noticed immediately as being incredibly good at getting fish. She was not much higher than the gunnels at this point of the boat, but she was pulling in fish madly. <laughs> and so her father, well, all right, you're going to be on the boat. That's good. And then when she was a teenager, she decided to start wearing trousers. This is the late 1700s. Now, women, quite a few women did wear trousers at sea. It was much more practical than wearing a big, heavy wool skirt. But nobody wore it on land. But just she wasn't disguising herself as a man. She just started wearing trousers. She said, I like them better. It was said she wore a skirt to church, but most people pointed out that she wore trousers underneath the skirt when she went to church. So, and then she, people started asking her advice. She was really clever. Um, and she was fishing for her, boat, her brother, but then her brother lost his boat through a way that we don't need to go into here. So at the same time, there was another guy who lived there who was about seven years older than she was. And against all probability, he became rich very young. He was also very clever. And everybody called him Jan Rike, or, or Jan Rich, because he was, nobody could understand how he could have got rich, because nobody did. But he already had a boat. And he really wanted the best deckhand of the area, which was Thurder, who he got as his deckhand after his bro her brother's boat got destroyed. So Thurder started working for Jan Rich. So I'm going to read you just a little bit of the book to show you the kind of detail that I was able to get. It was amazing, through looking at lots of old documents and things. Um, they seem to have stuck together. Uh, this is about just one time that when she was a deckhand, and she would have been, well, she was about 20, or a little over 20 at this time, that they, a day fishing. And this is from, so there's the community of Stock City, and then next to it is the community of Erebaki. And there are lots of reefs out from there, and beyond it, the huge Atlantic surf. So that's where people took these rowboats out and fished a lot. And many people died. Okay, this is a day's 
but it is out fishing. Their captain, Jan Rich, Captain Jan Rich, right, soon arrived and they dragged the boat across the rocks and into the water, joining eight other boats out on the open ocean. Thirty there, as usual, she got very famous for this, surveyed the weather. She was brilliant. People started following her in and out because she was so brilliant at reading the weather. Good now, but unsettled, sure to change. Sure enough, a sudden strong wind soon sprang up. They pulled up their lines and rushed toward the nearby Edabaki shore before the surf rose. Everyone else did the same. The Skerries at Edabaki lay in a parallel line out from shore, with boats entering through a narrow gap between Skerries. Only one boat could enter at a time. As the waves got worse, Jan Rich's boat skimmed over the water at speed, one of the first to arrive at the channel entry. Thududur took note of the tide. Returning through the Edabaki Passage on an ebb tide was much more dangerous than a rising one. She nodded in satisfaction. Luckily, the tide was incoming. They pulled the boat from the water and paused to watch the other boats arrive. Six made it swiftly to shore, but two, clearly with weaker crews, lagged behind. They did a glance at her crewmates. Not good. Surf was mounting fast now cresting over the outer line of Skerries. The lead boat, which held four people, entered the narrow entrance, veered in the churning backwash, crashed into one of the outside Skerries, and became solidly wedged against the rocks. No matter how hard they pushed with their oars, the crew couldn't get it off. Violent surf now smashed the boat back and forth against the sharp lava. They'd break up in no time. As Thududur and everybody else watched, the second boat, close behind them, intentionally veered its own course directly toward the scary. At great risk to themselves, they would now try to save the stranded man. This was going to be tricky. Any overweight made a dangerous difference in these open boats, especially in rough waters. Unbalancing it could make it easily flip. Still, through buffeting waves, the crew members managed to pull two of the stranded men into their boat. They've now overloaded it, its gunnels riding barely above the waterline. Any more weight would sink them. An impossible choice of who to save with no time for debate. They left the other two men behind. As the others rowed to safety, these two clung desperately to the damaged boat as it began to break apart, filling steadily with water. On a rising tide, the waves now crashed over the scary and would soon submerge it. Then they drowned. Thududur glanced at her crewmate Gamlison. They'd seen this tragedy too many times before. They all then looked at Captain Jan Rich. Any rescue attempt was his responsibility. He yelled at the other skippers, aren't you going to give me people so I can get these men? The other skippers looked out at a sea increasingly white with froth, the scary a good 1,200, sorry, treacherous watery feet from shore. They shook their heads. Neither of the men on the rock were kin. They wouldn't take the risk. So no one did. Jan Rich shrugged and turned to his crew. He tried more than anyone else was willing to do. It's probably not a good attempt, idea to attempt to rescue these men from the scary, he commented. I'm not going anywhere. Thurider kept her eyes on the two men struggling to stay above the sea's greedy maw. It will be known to the authorities if you don't make an attempt to get these men, she said very quietly. Jan Rich's other crew members stopped what they were doing and stared. Jan Rich jumped up and glared at Thurder. Then you take my job and be responsible for ship and crew, he shouted. Not that he expected her to take his angry invitation seriously. He should have known better. Thurder considered her captain's words. She assessed the risk, the distance, her crewmates. She nodded. I'll do it, she said to Jan Rich. I'll guarantee you the safety of the crew, she paused. But I can't promise the same for your vessel. She looked at her crewmates. They looked from one to another. They'd go if she led them. Jan Rich gave her an infuriated wave and stormed up the bank. Thurder and her crewmates quickly pulled the boat back into the water and set off. 
With her thirded at the helm, they rowed rapidly through the spray, sliding alongside the Scarian minutes. Then, balancing the boat, they dragged the two men aboard. Thirded ordered them to shove off fast. In an instant, they were rowing toward shore again. They'd done it, and they hadn't even damaged John Rich's boat. But the following year, the authorities issued an award for bravery in the daring and courageous rescue of the two shipwrecked men. They awarded it to John Rich, who happily accepted it. So what's amazing is that None of that is me fictionalizing. That's what's so astonishing about the records. The verbatim conversations were written down. Those were written by people who either interviewed other deckhands, interviewed people who were there. People wrote all this down. It was phenomenal. That's, that shows the level, because of the records that are in Iceland, that I could get. It's phenomenal, with a whole bunch of research assistants and scholars and people who helped me transcribe all these old handwritten documents. But it, it was amazing. So as time went on, so Jonrich grew very increasingly dependent on her, actually. And she was calling the weather. The crew members really got so they were following her, not him. This is all recorded. And then she got offered by the pastor to captain a boat he had. So she, of course, did it. Ever after, Jan Rich hated her. Because before, with her on his crew, he was getting the most fish of the entire area. With her, with her own boat, which was bigger than his, by the way, she was catching at least as much as he was, if not more. And so for the entire rest of their lives, he tried to destroy her again and again and again. This is all recorded too. So then, in 1827, so Iceland, remember, was incredibly oppressed, and there was a home invasion robbery of a very wealthy farmer. And the elite of Iceland and the authorities there were terrified. They were, they, it's interesting, they wrote about hearkening back to the French Revolution. They were sure that the, the impoverished people of Iceland were going to rise up and kill them or something. And also, Stokser and Edebaki, everybody had to be tied to farmers, so they were very much controlled. But Edebaki and Stokser were very much fishing communities, and so they were very suspect because they were more free in a way, in a certain way. And so they were wrote quite a bit about how they felt that they were more degenerate as people. So the county commissioner, who had huge power, he, they had to find who the robbers were. So he first went to Jan Rich to find out. Nobody really wanted to talk to them, because who knows who they were? They could be their kinsmen, right? He just didn't know. They're, everybody's pretty related. They're a small community. So he went to Jan Rich, and Jan Rich had made himself, he had been, he'd got himself elected to be a deputy at this point. So that was sort of the, it, it was a lower official, but it was something that just a regular Icelander, if you got a lot of um, influence, could attain. So Jan Rich was that. So he went to Jan Rich, and he said, well, you know, tell me who, who did this crime. Do you know, who do you think did it? And Jan Rich, who didn't want to tell him any more than anybody else, he said, well, and then he thought, oh, I can get back at Thurither. So he said, oh, Thurither has, she's better at observation than anybody else in this entire area. If she can't figure it out, nobody can. So the county commissioner called on Thurither. Now, he knew that she wasn't likely to help him either, so he set up a trap. And he, um, she was, Thurdu was out when he came to have, sent a messenger to get her. She was out tarring her boat, wearing trousers and just a jacket, spattered with tar. And she said, when the messenger said, we well, have to come and talk to the county commissioner, she went, she said, well, I, I'll go and change. And he said, no, 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 you can't change. You have to come as you are right now. So he didn't allow her to change. So she 
appears at the county commissioners. And this is what happened. She arrived at the very nice house where the county commissioner was staying, entered the parlor, and greeted him. Commissioner Thorther greeted her in return, motioning to the messenger and others hovering around to leave. Now, they did leave, apparently, but they were obviously just outside the door because there are several accounts of what happened, by the way. Glancing down at her tar-spattered jacket and trousers, Thurder told him that she'd been working when his messenger rushed her to come without giving her a chance to change. Yet, I should not have come before you dressed in this way, she apologized. The same goes for me as others, Commissioner Thorther replied. I have heard before now that your everyday wear is men's clothing. But for that, you need a license. Now, in reality, no record of such a license seems to exist. Several scholars and I looked through everything. During the, in Laksadala and in the saga times, up to the 1290s, there were laws against cross-dressing, with exile being the punishment, but not at this time. There was nothing. Nowhere is there evidence of this supposedly required license. Not that it made any difference. As county commissioner, Thorther could say whatever he liked. He expected Thorther to be reluctant to help him. He clearly considered this and laid out his trap before she arrived. This license I will obtain for you, he now said, if you will give me a hint as to rob the Camber farm. Effectively, the county commissioner gave Thurder no choice. She'd help him or he'd prosecute her for wearing trousers. Who was robbed and where, Thurder asked. He outlined the facts he knew of the robbery, including the items found at the scene, a tattered hat, an iron rod, and a dropped shoe. May I see the shoe, Thurder asked noncommittally. Commissioner Thorther pulled the shoe out of the bag and gave it to her. Thurder turned it over in her hands, examining it carefully. The woman who made this shoe is highly skilled, she said after some consideration. It's been worked in a special way that I have seen only at three farms. And where's that? Commissioner Thorther asked eagerly. This was unexpected. Was she going to give him a name now? With an impassive look, Thurther told him that the first of the three farms was his own. Commissioner Thorther flushed, unsure whether to be complimented at the skill of a woman on his farm, probably his wife, or to be insulted at the idea of someone in his household could have been associated with such a crime. Was Thurder being clever, mocking him, or making some sort of point? He settled on a defensive middle ground. True, he agreed, as if he knew such sewing details himself. But do you suppose that my men have been on such business? I do not suppose so, Thurder replied evenly. The second is from Govrebeyer. That's the pastor's farm. She paused, but I am sure the robbers are not from there. She then stood in silence. The county commissioner gave her a steely glare. Name the third. So that's how we got her to help him. But you know where you're reading fiction and you have the detective come and solve the crime. Usually they're the policeman or something. They didn't have this protection. So being put in that position in a small community where some people love you intently and some people do not because you're controversial gets very, very complicated. Um, through, the, through her life, um, she continued to do these amazing things. She realized that she could go to court. She started going to court um, for people who harassed her for being different, wearing trousers. Uh, she then went to court on behalf of a woman who was abused by her husband. It was pretty well considered okay to beat up your wife in many countries as well as Iceland this time. And later she actually sued the government when she was older. She got much more sophisticated. Uh, she fished until she was 63. And then she became 
a guide for Danish people leading them around because they didn't know a way around, or uh, she took messengers. And there's these incredibly detailed accounts of her going over terrifying mountain passes. Um, we, some Icelandic friends of mine and I, we actually, well, we drove part of the way, <laughs> but it wasn't in the middle of the winter like it was with her, but we went over the same area. And the, the I mean, we had old maps, a lot of this. For instance, part of what, how I can describe the coast, we got old maps and I talked to local people who still knew what was going on. We did a huge amount of that kind of research as well, but we got old maps and we were able to actually they were so detailed from the accounts and from that, we were able to actually find um, exactly where she went. So it's, it, because of the record, this is, it's a story of a remarkable woman who we'd never get. It's incredible, it's a kind of detail about a woman in history that these sort of women are not supposed to exist and is a kind of detail we never ever get. But it's also, because of that, it's about a community in which she lived, and a time. And as I got to know this information and writing it, I felt it, it speaks so much to what we have today, the same kind of fights, the same kind of oppression and powers and inequality and grief and love and tragedy. I just, I, it, it, I began to be so much involved myself, I have to say. So, you know, we, we create reality a lot in what we, I mean, we create history, I think is what I'm gonna say, into what we think of as reality now, and often it's transformed into what we think it should be now. And so often, and that's the role of women and a lot of people who are marginalized, they get written out. And in this case, because it's all written down, it shifts, it actually shifts how we might see a reality of history and our reality at present. Right? It's very lucky those accounts exist. Right. So that's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have any questions? I'd just like to know um, how oppressive the Danish rule was on Iceland. Or maybe it wasn't. It was terrible. Are you, are you Danish? What? Are you Danish? I'm half Danish. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it was really awful because, I mean, Iceland, they couldn't, now with global warming, they're beginning to grow some wheat a little bit now, it's seeming. They're trying to, but, you know, they didn't have any trees since the Vikings had cut them all down and the soil had all blown away. And so it's very, is a rock in the middle of the, you know, North Atlantic. So they did have cows, and they had milk, and they had sheep, which, of course, made sure no trees grew, too. But, uh, but they died a lot. I mean, the winters were really, really hard, and you had these springs, which went until June, where the snow didn't melt. And so the only, they had to get a lot of their goods transported from Denmark. And Denmark had a law for a long time that you could only trade with specific Danish merchants on pain of death. If you traded with anybody else, you were going to be died. They, they did, pain of death, starvation kind of trumping pain of getting caught, I think. But they could give them whatever goods they wanted, and they paid for fish, but in fish. And they could give whatever exchange rate they wanted. And so also, <laughs> Icelanders, the farmers controlled everything, so everybody had to be tied to a farmer. Um, and they only had one set of days, moving days, they called them in May, where you could change from one farmer to another. That farmer was considered your master. And they had a right to beat you, do whatever. And if you were a, a, a child that went in poverty, it was even, it was just horrific. Um, you weren't allowed to marry unless you could get a leasehold of a farm, which was very hard to do. So they weren't slaves, exactly. I would say they were closer to serfs. They weren't bought and sold, but they could only move from one master to another once a year. Yeah, and you had to get somebody else to take you. So it was really, really oppressive. 
and they did that for six. Oh, they started. They became an autonomous region in the in 1918. Um, they're still incredibly impoverished, and it wasn't until the end of World War II that they got independence and the whole country started to change. And a lot of Icelanders talk to me about this, and they say, well, you know, uh, one, I, I won't say it. I have it in the book, but I won't be able to say it exactly like she did. She wrote, said it very beautifully that, you know, people think that we're like other Nordic countries, but we're not. It's like 600 years of poverty don't, don't go away in mere lifetimes. They said they're in our literature, in, in the way we relate to the land, in the way we live our lives. She said, she said, we are survivors with all the insight, strength, and scars that name implies. Hi. Um, you kind of touched upon this a little bit, but I'm curious about what specifically in her personality or characteristics that the Iceland people really worship, and how does that trickle down to uh, the Icelandic culture of today in terms of treating women or in terms of um, like this uh, believing in her daring ability, like how, how does it trickle down to today's modern world? Um, well, Iceland now is touted as having the greatest gender equality in the world. They don't see right now. When I, uh, the, uh, because of a, a certain quota system, the way they do their fisheries, unfortunately, the ability of women to have equality at sea is going backwards rather than forwards in Iceland right now. But compared to the states, there's no comparison. Women have a huge amount more equality there than they do here. Um, you know, I think it's interesting because I think, I mean, I've thought about, if I can answer, I'm not sure if I can quite answer your question, but thinking about it, at the time that Thurida lived, I mean, if she'd been earlier in the 1600s, there was a woman who was accused of witchcraft because she got too rich and had too much power. So that's, they tried to crush her that way. The church did. They wanted her land. Um, I put a little bit in the book about her because they, they named her daughter after her. <laughs> so, but, and later, sort of from the mid, sort of in the 1860s, when Thurida had was, you know, at the end of her life, things in Iceland started to change a lot. And when I did my previous research, I saw that the women who were really good at sea, and there were other captains, there was just a lot more written about Thurida. That's why I could write about her, because she did all these other, she's, this crime and all that made people, and she wore trousers, a lot of people wrote about her. But there were a lot of other captains, and people wrote poetry, laudatory poetry, about these early Helms women, and, captains and people who were incredibly strong at sea. And there was nothing derogatory. I didn't find anything derogatory at all. Starting in the late 1800s, you start seeing them say things like, she was, it was said she liked to be at sea even better than in the kitchen. She was as good at rowing as she was at knitting. And so you see, first what you see is the woman should be in the house, really, but she's being at sea, and so it's not derogatory, but it's placing her first in the house. You see that shift? And then toward the late 1800s, you see people who are trying to be complimentary are saying, well, you'd think she might look like a troll because she was so good at sea, but really she wasn't. So then you start seeing, and then in the 1900s, it's straight derogatory. And you see the same thing with Thurida. People write about her by the late 1800s. This pastor writes this whole long thing about her, saying, well, you know, she was applauded in her time, but really, she went to court a lot, so she was a really aggressive, nasty person. She went to court for really good things, but he doesn't record that, you know. He, and then by the 1900s, for the other woman and for her, they're calling them ketlings, which means basically hag. This is an acclaim, you know, a well-known... A historian uses this same word, and he starts, he put things in such as, oh, she started drinking a lot. There's no evidence anywhere that she started drinking a lot. There, he's, he's just making things up. He even says, oh, you know, we don't even know if she was out of claim to see. There are hundreds of accounts of her amazingness at sea. You know, and he's an historian, so it's just, he couldn't, so you saw 
this unacceptability of women in these roles. And now, you know, so, you know, gender equality doesn't go in this nice little line like that at all. It's just going like that. And so I think, you know, we can look at this today, too, here. You know, we can look at what, what are we looking at in terms of women's ability and rights and ability to have these jobs that are considered, you know, brave and courageous and be daring. So um, I, I'll be interested. The book is coming out in Iceland at the end of this month. I don't know yet what in, they're going to say. In translation or in English? No, I'm trying to get it translated into Icelandic. But as a foreigner, it's quite hard to get them to translate it into Icelandic, actually. To get them from Icelandic into English is much easier. So we shall see. That's, that's an ongoing project. I have several friends in Iceland who are trying to get that to happen. But, it, but a lot of Icelanders read English. So it will be, it is being out in the people who know Amundsen, which is the main bookstore. It will be there at the end of the month. But a lot of Icelanders helped me with the book. And, and so I have a lot of people who have been involved in this. So we'll see what happens there. Did you uh, learn much Icelandic for this? And how hard was it to um, do the research um, given the language barrier? My spoken Icelandic is not very good. It's, you know, I can talk, but not brilliantly, because I have never lived there for a long time. And everybody speaks English, too. Most people do. But, um, and my reading is much better, because that's um, what I mostly have focused on in terms of the Icelandic. Uh, my knowledge is also a very 19th century vocabulary. I know these words that my research assistants do not, which I'm very happy to say, and words like neither setingutter and, and omai, which are words of poverty. They mean indigent and indigent and really poor people, and it's, it's a whole into the system of oppression of the time, and these words have gone out of usage, which is actually kind of good. But, so that's, that's it. Um, I could have never, um, this, this book took an entire community to do. Uh, I, I'm responsible for it, I wrote it, so I take full responsibility there. But um, I've had a huge number, I've had tons of research assistants who's worked, with, I've been very lucky in getting grants. I got a grant from National Geographic and the story Sturluson, um for archival research. Archivists help. Um, I had really good research assistants. And then these old documents. I mean, we went through boxes and boxes and boxes of these old handwritten documents. And they're written in a mix of sort of Icelandic and Danish. You may have done, been able to do better of it. But it, they're really hard to read. And also, the handwriting is almost impossible to decipher. And they're these yellowed, crappy pieces of paper. So even a, a regular Icelander can't read these. So, but there are scholars who are really good at it. And a whole bunch, several of those, the best scholars, I think, in Iceland, were so generous. And they transcribed them. They said, oh, give them. We took photographs. We took photographs of tons and tons of these documents. We took photographs of, I mean, the original court documents were also really detailed. This was amazing, you know? And so, uh, so we photographed all that and then looked at them later. Spent you know a long time getting that, and so these people, some of them are readable, but some of them aren't. And so the worst ones we gave to these people, who incredible generosity, just said, "Oh yeah, I'll do it." That's, that's incredible. The local people of Stokseri me a foreigner, they've supported me from the beginning. They said, "You better write this book." <laughs> and so a lot of, in fact, I gave a talk at Dartmouth the other day before yesterday, and I did it as a memoriam because it was the day of a funeral of one of the people who helped me incredibly in Stock City. These people, their knowledge is being lost now. They're in their 80s. And he, um, for instance, that Stock City shore, that Edabaki shore, I went with him with old documents. And he, his family's been there for a 1,000 years. And he had this, he's like a savant. He could remember the names of people living on farms back 300 years and how they came in. And he took me out to where Thurder brought in her boat, and you could see out this chipped out basin where she chipped it out, where she'd washed her fish. I mean, he knew exactly all this information. It's going to be lost. It's really sad. But 
So that's how it happened, with a huge amount of support. My acknowledgments are several pages long. <laughs> So it sounds like the research was really extensive. Did, did it take years of research to do, roughly? Yes. <laughs> no, I, t I tell you, I started, I started researching, seriously researching for the previous book in 2013. I got a, a, I got a National Geographic for them. Thank you very much to them. And so I went to Iceland then and spent, I took two quite long trips at that point doing the research for that book and then wrote that and did a lot of historical research. So I would have to include that because then I began to understand this, this incredible history. And, and my knowledge of the history of Iceland is really 17, 1800s and then up to the present. I don't really know it very well. I mean, I know the general things earlier than that, but that's my focus. I'll be truthful there. And that, I grew to understand how that society worked and the interactions, and I got a feel for it a lot. And, I, and then when we did, we went around Iceland, as this grant, this was like the grant from heaven, right? So with my research assistant for that book, we drove, <laughs> she drove, it was terrifying because we didn't march. So we drove, you know, people drive the ring road. Well, we drove to every tiny community around Iceland looking for women working at sea. Because people would say, oh, there's nobody here. And then you go to the town, and they say, oh, wait, my cousin, Maria, she's actually been at sea for, what, 20 years, actually? Yeah, yeah. So that's how we found them. And we interviewed all these women who'd worked at sea, over 200. And so <laughs> I got this feel of the country and, and sort of how people think. And I began to understand a lot more. And also, I, this good friend, Augusta, I call her Deesa in the book, but I'll just tell you. Her name's Augusta, the one who'd lived with me. Her, I stay, I've stayed with Icelanders. I could have never done this without staying with Icelanders. You know, it's too expensive. And they were so generous. And so I under, they showed me a lot of um, the depth of thinking and connections. So I learned a lot. So I'd say from 2013, and then I started seriously working on this book in 2018. So I would say from then on, and then I wrote it during the pandemic. But I was also incredibly lucky during that time that the Stephenson Arctic Institute, which I'm a senior scientist there, they, we were gonna do another project, they had this person working on it, and the guy who's director said, well, we don't want, you know, we really have already hired this woman, and she's just getting her master's degree, and she's really smart, and, wouldn't you like her as your virtual research assistant? I said, oh. So Sven Birk helped me during the pandemic when I needed anything. So it's fantastic. So yes, it has taken a long time. But it was really exciting. You know? I didn't expect to find near this information. Everybody I was working with got excited too. We're just going, what? There's more written? I would say for these, you know, I do say, and I say at the beginning of the book, I say, I say things like she smiled or she said this way. I say, I've made that up, you know, just to add to the narrative. But only when I have an indication that they're that way, or if I say they thought something, it's only when the original document shows that there's an indication that they were thinking that way. All the verbatim conversations are recorded. And when they're not, it might have said, she said it was a sunny day in the original, right? And I say, just to make the narrative better, I say, it was a sunny day, in quotes, she said. And when I do that, I make a citation and I say, I've taken that into quotes. It's that incredible. I'm not making any of it up. That's what's so outrageous. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, the book is on sale downstairs in the shop if you want to purchase that from us and from here and have Margaret sign it. Thank you so much, Margaret, for your, this wonderful um, talk. Um, and I hope to see everyone come back to Scandinavia House.